chance today's experts could take some tips from the Dragons as they aim for flipping profit in half an hour on BBC Two. First, as the world's best golfers come to Northern Ireland, Rick Farragher discovers what happened the last time the Open was played at Port Rush. Just under 70 years ago, a small group of men from around the world landed on our shores with just one thing on their minds, returning home victorious. It would have meant everything to him to, to, to win. I was North Ireland champion. He had a feeling about it. it, things were right. Their skills and experience varied. Among their ranks were fresh-faced lads straight out of national service, former boxers, even the son of an American spark plug tycoon. These guys were colourful characters. Bag of clubs over each other looking like somebody from outer space. Their weapons of choice were fashioned from iron and wood, but their determination was built of steel. It was so different. I'd love to be able to recreate it. Yet the battle that was about to unfold wouldn't be fought in fields, but on fairways. And for the first and only time in over 150 years, it would happen right here in Northern Ireland. This is the story of the 1951 Open. Although the Causeway tram had reached the end of the line in the previous decade, summers in Portrush in the 1950s saw streets packed with rosy-cheeked holidaymakers. Young divers cooled off with a splash, donkeys plodded up and down the beach, and regular firework displays lit up the faces of thousands gazing skyward from Ramore Head. In the summer of 1951, though, there was something different in the seaside air. Port Rush was celebrating the Festival of Britain. Yet the real drama was still to come. It would unfold across five days in July as nearly 200 men descended on the town to battle it out in one of the biggest sporting events in the world. Having started in 1860, golf's open tournament is older than Northern Ireland itself. From humble beginnings where just eight players competed to win a leather belt, by the mid 20th century, golf had hit the big time. Players like Henry Cotton and Ben Hogan had become household names, and scooping the Open's Claret Jug trophy was the ultimate prize. In short, the Open had become the title everyone wanted to win. Would-be pros are everywhere in the world of golf, but reaching the top of the game is harder than anyone can imagine. For most, reality eventually sets in. Yet regardless of skill level, if you are a golfer, you know that Royal Port Rush is hallowed ground. In fact, it was recently named as one of the top 10 courses in the world. And behind this door is a man who can tell us how the club came to hold the 1951 Open, how it very nearly missed out. When it's a question of golf history, Hugh Clark has the answer. We already had a seriously high reputation, uh, not just as a golf course, but also for being able to host major championships. So the Open was coming to Royal Port Rush, but it nearly went to Royal County Down. I, indeed, I think that uh, a very senior member of our championship committee uh, had, I think, made such a suggestion that it might be held at Royal County Down. But I believe that ultimately the Professional Golfers Association um, recommended that it be held here. And just beside us here are, these are the letters that sealed the deal. Um, I'm looking here, this one's dated November 1949. This is the invitation from the RNA. Yes, these are historic documents. Um, and uh, it uh, was no doubt seen as a great honour uh, for the club to be invited by the RNA to host uh, the Open. And uh, I see that the club's letter um, of reply uh, indicates that their club is very happy to act as host. The stage was set. 183 of golf's finest players landed in Port Rush. Each had their own reasons for wanting to win. One was very close to home. Fred Daly, tell me about him. Fred was diminutive in stature, but immensely powerful golfer, 
arms like Popeye, brilliant iron player, raised on the golf course, um, born in Causeway Street in Portrush. His father was a blacksmith. He was the local man, a quintessential working class Portrush man, playing on the course he knew so well. It, it would have meant everything to him to win. All in all, 14 nationalities were on the scorecard. Also lending the event an international flavour were Egyptian professional Hassan Hassanine and Australian Norman von Nieder. But the UK had its fair share of contenders too, including a 20-year-old who would go on to become a household name. Everyone knows Peter Alice now as the voice of BBC Golf, but he was a tremendous golfer in his own right. I played in the opening in 1947. The war had just ended. The pro shops were empty, there was no clothes to buy, there was no food to eat, and they ran the Open Championship. I think the first prize was £150. I didn't do 48, 49, 50, because I did my national service. But 51 went to uh, the Royal Port Rush with my brother. I'd only been out of the RAF regiment about uh, six weeks, so I really had no practice, and we went over. Bag of clubs over each other, looking like something from outer space. So he was a young man when he came here. Uh, his father had been a professional before him, Percy Alice. Oh, you're young Alice. Oh, yeah, your dad, da 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 da. And oh, he looks as if you can play a bit. So I was on the ladder sort of early on, or people of the profession recognised me and treated me very, very nicely. World War II was, of course, still fresh on people's minds. And another ex-serviceman was hoping he'd be in with a fighting chance at Portrush. Max Faulkner, probably above any other player in the field, had lived his life towards winning an Open. He was just beginning to make a name for himself as a professional golfer in 1939 when he was 23. Dad's first boys tournament, he had to cycle from Bramley to, I think it was West Hill. Yeah. He cycled there and he won the tournament by 16 shots. <laughs> and that's when Grandpa thought, ooh, this boy's got potential. Yeah. But by 1951, Max's fortunes had taken a turn for the worse. He wasn't playing well in 1951 up until then. And he said to my mother at the time, you know, if I don't do well this year, I'm going to have to sell my nice new car. He'd bought a new Allard sports car and a nice one. Brian Barnes, Max's son-in-law, was a talented pro golfer in his own right. Max taught Brian his famous swing, and they were close companions both on and off the course. When I first met Maxie, yeah, I was used to hit a high-flying hook. And Maxie said, if you want to be a good, consistent pro, you, the distance you hit the ball, you've got to start fading the ball and use 80% of your power. And um, because of that, I became one of the straightest and the longest hitters in the business. Also coming from the Southern Hemisphere was a man who'd had several big wins in his home country, but had yet to scoop a major title. Who was Antonio Cerda? Antonio Cerda was uh, an Argentinian golfer, very popular amongst his fellow professionals. Uh, and for him to, to win something like the Open Championship would have elevated him from the level he was to, it would have just taken him to a different level. A talented player, he'd won the 1949 Argentinian Championship, he'd also won the 1950 Spanish Open, so he wasn't without form. A real contender for the title of Open Champion also had links to Northern Ireland, but was making a much longer trip to the course. Bobby Locke probably arrived in Portrush as the best player in the world. Uh, he'd won the two previous Opens, so he was going for a hat-trick of Open Championships. But it actually turns out that his father, Charles, emigrated to South Africa from the Lisburn Road in Belfast in 1889. And he played in 59 tournaments. He won 11. He finished runner-up 10 times, and he was third eight times. For one local lad, though, the 1951 Open was just the beginning. Norman was the youngest competitor. He was a 19-year-old amateur when he played in 51. And Norman would go on to have a great career himself, be the first golfer to ever play in the Walker Cup, Ryder Cup, and the World Cup. Where I lived in, in Belfast, was in, at Prairie, we were, I lived in Prairie Park. Prairie Park was a one-sided park. 
and that side was Balmore Golf Club. So for our own amusement, most of most of the boys or young boys around Prairie Park played golf. Did you ever feel intimidated by playing against these top pros? You were another player, and you were on the first tee, at your cans, and you said, "Right, well, we have a good game," and that was all you really talked about around the course. I was North of Ireland champion. Whether there was open or not, <laughs> I was still the champion North of Ireland. The first challenge for Norman and everyone else was to make it through two days of qualifying rounds before the Open began in earnest. On Monday the 5th of July, play got underway at Port Rush and Port Stewart. The usual fairly intense first two days, uh, people getting to know the course, find their feet. And the person that really shone was Tony Serda, who headed the qualifying. The undoubted favourite in 51 was Bobby Locke. Uh, he was coming into the tournament having won in 49 and 50, looking to complete a hat-trick, and he was probably the foreign player in the world at the time. And it wasn't just the seasoned pros who came in with confidence in the qualifiers. It was that sort of, I wouldn't say cocky, but my game was, was pretty good and I wasn't frightened of any course. Most of the star players would have felt confident enough to treat the qualifiers as practice rounds for the real deal. But one had a feeling fortune would look kindly on him. Max may have come into the tournament with very little form, but it didn't show in his demeanour on the course. Uh, he interacted with the crowd. Yeah, he, he used did to that do quite that a lot. He, he said it helped him a bit, didn't yeah. he? Yes. And he had, had a premonition. He, he said he had a premonition that he was going to win it or something big was going to happen to him. He was um, 71 in the first round and the leader was 68, which was pretty incredible. So in qualifying, Peter, you opened up with a 76 at Port Stewart. How did you get on at Port Rush in the second day of qualifying? Well, I, I, 76 was not, not brilliant by any means. I, I can't remember what the best score was. It might have been 68, 68, I don't remember. But I went out and I enjoyed, the weather was pretty good. And I hold a few putts and I got round the, the big course in 69. So I was one four five for a couple of rounds and qualified for the championship. That score saw Peter end the qualifiers on equal footing with Fred Daly. No mean feat for the youngster. While at Port Stewart, Fred had finished one under par. What was the atmosphere like um, during qualifying? Obviously, all these players from all around the world had, had arrived in, in, in Port Rush. Uh, what, what was the atmosphere like? Well, the atmosphere was that there was, uh, some, there was a crowd always for somebody. Uh, so I say, there was a, Fred Dilly always had a big crowd. He was from Port Rush. All in all, 98 players made the cut with a score of 155 or better to progress through to the Open proper the next day. Argentinian Antonio came top of the qualifying leaderboard and young Belfast lad Norman sailed through comfortably. The play now concentrated at Port Rush. Wednesday morning began with one newspaper predicting a Bobby Lock win if the weather remained calm. One opportunistic bookmaker set up stall at the 18th and took bets on the South African scoring a hat-trick of open wins. But as Bobby and Fred took to the tees that morning, a strong northerly wind blew across the course. Well, wind affects any golf course, uh, a Lynx course even more, and Royal Portrush even more again, for the simple fact that Royal Portrush knew no two holes really go in the same direction. For Bobby Locke, the course probably wouldn't have suited his eye anyway. Uh, the type of shot he played, it wouldn't have favoured, and he definitely would have found the wind difficult. What is it about this hole that makes it so difficult? It's aptly named Calamity. It's an iconic par three, probably one of the toughest par threes in the world. And tell me then, what happened to Bobby Locke here? Uh, for somebody like, um, Bobby Locke, this just wouldn't sit his eye at all. His natural shot was from right to left. There's no area he can land there. He would have to have hit a perfect shot. 
Uh, unfortunately, on the Wednesday was the only day that he didn't get up and down and he dropped the shot. But that area, that swale became known as Bobby Locks Hollow and it's known as that to this day. Norman Von Nida was a diminutive Australian, quite a fiery character. He wore a trademark beret. But Norman had been struggling with a cold, and on top of that, he had tennis elbows, so his arm was uh, strapped up. But he actually managed to shoot a, a magnificent 68. You would have thought that Fred Daly would have played well from the outset with the bit of wind or whatever, but he didn't have the best start. Uh, he found the rough on the first two holes, uh, and he was out in the front nine of 39, which uh, wasn't the start he was looking for. Some other players, though, had a more lively start to round one. I opened up with a 69 away, you know. Then my brother and I went down to the local dance hall that night. I met a couple of girls on holiday from London. <laughs> At the end of round one, Bobby was third on the leaderboard, tied with Max on 71. Incredibly, despite his illness, Norman von Neider shared first place with English player Jimmy Adams, while Norman Drew had a share of the amateur lead. I, I played pretty good, I must admit. The 18th where I took six, I drove it into a bunker. I was trying to make the green from where, where I was. And it was really, it, it was a silly shot when you think about it. If I had got a, a par at the last, a forward the last hole, I'd have been in front of Frank Strahan. It looked as if Bobby's shot at an open hat-trick was fading fast. Max had struggled throughout the day, meaning having to sell his car could become a real eventuality. While Fred's dream of scooping the open on his home turf looked to be in trouble. The next day's play, however, would change everything. With a second call of players due to take place that night, the pressure was on for players to perform. It was a day that would see one local player make a comeback while two British players would fail to make Friday's play. Max actually came into form and the putter got red hot. Uh, from the seventh to the twelfth hole, he single putted and he finished with 24 putts for the whole round, which suddenly thrust him into contention. The greens were lightning fast and Dad had got hold of this, this putter uh, with a very long, thin shaft and um, and he just had this you just had to touch it and it would go and he loved that and he was putting like a magician every round was less than 30 putts well as max faulkner was making his move on the thursday so too was fred uh, he really found a bit of form and his 70 which included uh, a really good three at calamity corner uh, elevated him into third place and really in contention Favourite Bobby Locke wasn't so lucky, with his play described as shaky. But for Norman and Peter, round two proved to be the end of the line. You shot 75 in round one, Norman, but round two was very difficult. It was uh, an 88. Um, what, what are your kind of thoughts when you, when you look back on round two? I was so disappointed that I had played reasonably well, and then to come the calamity and it fell off the green but ran down this bank and uh, just after two or three shots, I realized it was so hard to get it back up the hill. I played poorly, I played silly, and I realized then that if you're gonna, if you're gonna try and play properly, you're gonna feel, you can't go out and do silly things. I wasn't on the ball. By the end of round two, the highest position on the leaderboard belonged to Max, with a two-day score of 1-4-1. One, one. Fred was three shots behind on 1-4-4, ahead of Bobby Locke and Antonio Serda. For the final day's play, Max had been paired with Frank Stranahan. Max knew Frank and wasn't taking any chances. He said, look, look, Frank, I'm delighted to be playing with you tomorrow, but would you not say anything to me at all, please? And Frank said, yeah, sure, if that's the way you want it. And how do you think he would have been feeling at this point? He told me that uh, he had great difficulty sleeping. Uh, you know, he was reliving his whole life, so to speak. On the cusp of winning, and as Max tossed and turned, the next day dawned. On Friday morning, 46 players had made it through to play the final two rounds of the 1951 Open. By the end of the day, one of them would be holding the claret jug.
Well, Max Faulkner may have been leading, uh, but uh, Fred Daly was close, so a lot of people would have fancied Fred. And because Bobby Locke, although he probably hadn't played his best, was still very much in contention, I think for a lot of people it still would have been Bobby Locke. For Max Faulkner, though, it had been a fraught night. He was, had a room at the hotel and there were some waiters laughing and joking at about one o'clock at night and he got on, stood on a chair, opened the window, yelled down, why don't you shut up, I've got the last round of the Open tomorrow. And <laughs> well, Max strolled confidently on to the first tee on the morning, on Friday morning, and said hello, Frankie, to Frank Stranahan, and Frankie didn't respond. Uh, you know, well, he got what he asked for. Things went smoothly for Max until near the end. The 16th, which is now the 18th, it, it is, there's a, a, it's a dog leg right, and there's a bunker judiciously placed, so you've got to be very accurate with your drive. And if you pull it slightly, there's, there's out of bounds around the left. And in those days, there was a barbed wire fence and he thought, well, I've got a chance here with this new four woods that he got hold of. And he managed to do it, chopped it, and it curled right round and landed on the green. And Frank Stranahan, who had said nothing to him all day, marched across the fairway with his hand outstretched. Max, he said, that's the finest shot I've ever seen in my life. Charlene Reed from Royal Port Rush helped me understand just how tricky Max's shot really was. OK, so, Lean, we're here on the 18th. It used to be the 16th in 1951. We need to get the ball from here to that green over there. What are our chances? Well, our chances are much better than Max Faulkner's. Um, whenever he played in 1951, there was actually a fence that ran along this fairway. OK, so a big 40-yard curve, left to right. Let's give it a go. Yeah. Oh, go. That is over the bunker, in the rough. Not awful, but definitely not great. Oh, I've overdone that. No, <laughs> no. That is gone. Well, it definitely went left to right, and that's in the rough as well. <laughs> Max's shot, though, helped him score 70 by the end of the morning. He was now six shots clear going into the final round ahead of Tony Serda and Merseysider Norman Sutton. Uh, and Bobby Locke was further back. He was eight shots off the lead. Fred, probably his chances went on that morning round and uh, 75 pretty much ruled him out of any chance of winning. He went to have lunch had uh, an extra helping of steak and kidney pudding because he thought this would build me up a bit. <laughs> then he went out, never practised normally, he went out for 10 minutes hitting shots. Then, um, you know, came back, walking back to the first tee, this young boy with his father came up to him and said, uh, the boy said, would you mind signing my ball, sir? And would you mind putting Open Champion 1951 on it? I said, what? I said, good God, I've got 18 holes to play. I said, oh, would nobody have catch me? <laughs> so I put Open Champion 1951. For Max, still confident on the outside, the pressure was starting to take its toll. In the last round of the Open, you know, the strain began to really get to him. Well, Bobby Locke was now eight shots off the lead, and I think the fact that he knew he probably hadn't a chance of winning uh, affected the rest of his game. Max uh, continued with his round. Uh, he was beginning to hear cheers and shouts from around the course as Tony Serra was making a charge. 34 for the front nine. Suddenly a tournament that looked all but over was anything but. And he had to take this and think, well, they might be doing well, but, you know, I'm still level fours, you know, I've got to keep calm. Then he came back to the 16th where he had done that wonderful shot in the morning and he thought, right, I'm not going to pull this. I'm going to hit this very lightly and dead straight. It bounced, bounced, bounced straight into the bunker. So then he had to chip out, get it on the green and he couldn't hold the putt. So that's another shot dropped. So then he went to the old 17th, which was a par five and uh, hit a really good drive, 
and then fell the putt. So that was a birdie four on the 17th. And stood on that 18th tee. But then that was the thing. And he was, he was thinking, right, just swing slowly as my dad taught me. And he did a perfect drive right down the middle between there. There were two bunkers right down in the middle. And then with his putter, he put it 18 inches away and, and hold the putt for a five. So now he's 74. Max had finished and he had to wait 45 minutes. Uh, Tony Serda was making his charge. He took the six at the 16th and they had runners who would come in off the course and go into the press room. And on this occasion, the runner went straight to Max and said, Tony Serda's taken a six, it's your open. The first thing he asked for was a cigarette, you know, because he hadn't smoked all day. And then when he got the news suddenly that Dad had won it, my mother was dancing round the place and, you know, God, she was, whoa. Really? <laughs> yes, <laughs> she was. Because, I mean, she was aware this would transform the family finances. And he had this check, it was 300 pounds, almost double what Fred Daly has got. And he's waving it in the air like this, and he said, this will pay for my son's education. Dad said, if I don't win this, I'm going to pack it all in because he, wasn't, he? Making, yeah, yeah. Um, he wasn't making enough money. Yeah. Become a farmer. But Max didn't need to pack it in or sell his car. He was presented with the claret jug by Brigadier Martin, captain of Royal Portrush Golf Club. I think a lot of people would have expected Max Faulkner, the great entertainer, to have held court in the clubhouse after his win. But he left pretty soon afterwards with the claret jug and his £300 cheque because he'd made a promise to his son Guy that he would play in the parents versus teachers match at his prep school at Aldrow in Surrey the next day. And the headmaster got up and said, uh, uh, welcomed everybody and, and said, it is a, a great honour for me to tell you that we have amongst us here today the 1951 Open Golf Champion. Uh, there was silence for about two seconds, and then everybody was... <laughs> we used to enjoy our games. When I missed a shot playing in a championship, I used to hand my club to a spectator and say, you could do better than that, couldn't you? <laughs> As the Open gets underway tomorrow, watch highlights each night here on BBC Two. But next, scrapyards, flea markets and just three weeks to make some flipping profit 